everybody. Welcome, welcome. My name is Laura Styles. I'm a media personality, morning show host for Hot 97, Sirius XM. And I am a proud, proud, proud uh, member of the Envision Fest team. And we bring you uh, some of the most amazing, you know, uh, um, festivals and content. And we always pair up with incredible women. So today I'm super excited because this is something that's very much needed. Uh, something that I need a lot of education on too. I mean, I, every day I continue to learn more and more. And, and as I've had different conversations with my peers, they always ask me these questions. So it was only right that the Envision team got together with some kick-ass women to break it down for you today. Um, so I'm going to let everyone that's on here introduce themselves uh, and, and tell us a little bit about what they do so you guys can learn. But I'm super excited. Today will be a lot of fun. And I want you guys to make sure that you submit as many questions as you have, because that's why all these amazing women are here for, to talk to you. The first time we got, we got everyone together and, you know, usually we would do this in person, but uh, thank you to technology. We're able to, you know, kick it with y'all from our living room and connect with y'all and, and give you everything that we have. So we're going to start off um, with talking to Nancy. Hi, Nancy. Oh, I can't hear you, Nancy. I think you're on mute. There oh you goodness. go. Hi, Nancy. Hi, how are you? I it's am so, great. It's so hard to meet. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and, and what you do. So um, right now, I work for the New York City Census. I'm the faith manager, actually. I mobilize faith leaders across the city um, to work with their congregations, with nonprofit CBOs. A lot of um, faith leaders have that attached to their organizations and really uh, mobilizing the community on the census um, and getting the word out. Um, so I work citywide and um, I'm just loving this work. Tell us a little bit about your background, where you're from and what inspired you to get into this work? Well, I, have, I, am, I am an immigrant first generation um, I identify as African American, actually, though, because I think of the time that I I came, I was born. Um, I grew up in the '80s here in New York and Harlem, so um, I, I identify as as African American. But my father is from Somalia. Big up Somalia, um, and I love the culture, and it's it's infused in my blood in terms of uh, politics and and fast talkers and um, people who really wanted really get involved with their their government. Um, my mother's from Venezuela, from Great. South America. Um, they met at City College learning English. Um, oh, wow, and, that's so good. Cool. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, and so um, she came here to be a nurse. Um, and I think one of the first things I remember is being in meetings with my dad um, because he took me to a community a gathering um, because at that time Columbia was trying to buy Morningside Park. Um, they wanted to take it over completely and make it part of the campus. I remember and the, I remember and the city was, yeah, and the city was very devastated at the time. It was really drug infested and the community held on um, for that green space. Um, and I remember my dad being really involved with that. And I think it's just, um, just part of my upbringing um, to care about the people around you and your community and also to fight for your rights. My dad was a fighter and he said that, you know, nobody's going to give you anything. You have to, you have to fight for your rights and to fight for your rights, you have to understand everything. My father was an immigrant and most immigrants, uh, first generation will tell me that it's true that many times their parents know more about the history of America and, and, all the history that you do, um, and Americans born here. So um, I was taught to love this country and, and to participate in it. So I, I'm very proud of the work that I do. I consider the census work part of the protest. Um, our communities have been undercounted and we need to mobilize and change this fear around it um, so that we can get this money, uh, so that our communities can get paid. Um, uh, so let's do that. Uh, so so I, and today, I today I'm so excited to have you because today you will break down all the myths, all you know, all the questions that people have about the census. So um, you are yeah, you are so important today. So we thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. Thank you for sharing this information. This is radical, and you this isn't the first time. So I thank you for being a leader um, in your community and putting this out here. You know, all and opening together. the platform. All of us are stronger together. So that's why we're yes. doing this. 
And next up, someone I'm really proud of, someone who's been part of the Envision family for a while. Uh, we have Deja Vox. Hi, Deja. Hey, y'all. My name's Deja Fox. I'm 20 years old. I'm calling in from my hometown here in Tucson, Arizona. Um, I'm a first-generation college student. I go to Columbia, so I've met the Envision team in real life in New York. Um, I have my background in grassroots organizing, community organizing around reproductive justice and the conference of sex education and birth control access, uh, but have since sort of scaled up my work and really leaned into this idea that as Gen Z, as someone who's 20 years old, we are digital natives, understand social media and the way that we can use it for social justice, um, and went on to become the youngest staffer on any of the 2020 presidential campaigns. I worked as the influencer and surrogate strategist on the Kamala Harris campaign out of her headquarters in Baltimore. Um, and now I occupy the position as a digital relational organizer um, at a political consulting firm called Main Street One. Uh, and I'm working with nonprofits as they transition uh, because of COVID and any other number of reasons into the digital space and help them build digital infrastructure and relationships um, online. So that's what I'm up to. That's what I've been up to. And that's me. Daisha, tell us a little about the inspiration. Like what has, what has uh, lit that fire in you to, to get involved? I was raised by a single mom here in Tucson, Arizona. I'm a first generation American. Um, and me and my mom struggled with everything from rent to food growing up. And by the time I was 15, there was issues of substance abuse in my household. Um, and it led me to actually experience what one in 30 young people in the US experience, which is hidden homelessness. Um, I was a youth on their own, an independent young person, bouncing around between friends' houses and eventually living with my boyfriend and his family at the time throughout high school. Um, I'm still independent to this day, um, but I've overcome sort of that housing insecurity um, and now also provide for my mom. And so that is me, what I do on a personal level um, and what I bring to this work, uh, understanding what it's like to have come from a background of housing insecurity and the way that that intersects with reproductive justice and our access to technology and the political system. That's right. So much to learn from you, uh, Deja. You're so young and you're such an inspiration to all the young people that are to all of us here on this panel. So we thank you for being uh, here with us. You got it. Uh, next up, we have Tiffany Lofton, the amazing Tiffany. How are you, Tiffany? Hey, I'm doing good. How are you? Thank you for having me. Good. Thank you so much, Tiffany. Please educate us. Let us know about the amazing work. You have been hustling. You have been working nonstop. So we thank you for taking the time for joining us today. I appreciate that. Thank you for having me. Um, so two years ago, I started at the NAACP, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, as the National Director of Youth in College. My job is simple. Um, I work with 25-year-old Black folks across the country to train them in three specific areas. The first is grassroots organizing. The second is leadership development. And the third is campaign um, advocacy. And uh, with the middle school, high school, and college students that I have the pleasure of serving and working with every single day. There's about 25,000 of them across the country that I work with. Um, mm -hmm. We're in this moment right now focusing on obviously civic engagement, making sure folks have what they need to make educated and smart decisions in the ballot box, fill out the census. We've been doing a lot of census work and, and uh, census recruitment and education. And then also, of course, because I work at the National NAACP and because I identify as a Black woman, the moment that we're having this panel comes at a time of a lot of grief and um, uh, anger and rage considering the state of the country right now with Black Lives Matter and the death of George Floyd, the non-arrest of the officers who murdered Breonna Taylor, uh, the, the list goes on. And so, so right now in this moment, my job is to also support the folks across the country who are organizing the protests and uprisings that you see in the country and the community. Um, we just had one yesterday in Michigan. I got two more happening in Virginia. We got one this weekend in DC on Sunday. We had one in Fresno not too long ago. There's another one in Austin that's happening. These, these protests that you all see that are happening, the NAACP is hands-on very much so with our young folks who are leading this movement, obviously. And um, we launched last Thursday our campaign to cut the contract between police departments and schools across the country. And as of right now, 11 schools have launched their petition to do so. So I'm um, very excited about the work that we're doing, but you're right, it's at a busy time. And unfortunately, folks who look like me, we're going through a lot right now. 
Um, but I'm reminding folks constantly that this is a marathon and not a sprint. And our, our urgency around this visceral moment to be outside and protest is directly connected to our civic engagement work, is directly connected to the ballot box, is directly connected to the census, is directly connected to district attorney races and the like. The NAACP had a conversation last night with Joe Biden um, around the black agenda and the issues that he stands for. And it's clear that no matter who you stand for or which office you're supporting and which party you're a part of, we all have a really long way to go. So that's my work. Um, but I'm excited to support folks who um, I work with and happy to be on this conversation to talk about things we can do. Uh, Tiffany, um, let's get a little personal. Just tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, your family, what inspired you yeah. to, to, to work for the NAACP and, and mobilizing young folks. Uh, so I'm originally from Los Angeles, California, born and raised. I moved down around a lot, but I claim Inglewood and um, went to the University of California, Santa Cruz. I'm not first generation, but I am the oldest of my family and the first to go to college within my siblings and the last to go to college in my siblings. And um, when I, when my mom encouraged me to go to college, she said, you know, I'm not able to provide you the funds to pay for school. I didn't, we didn't have a car. We didn't have internet or the computer. Um, I'm in the, I'm generation Z. I'm, I mean, excuse me, I'm millennial. So I was, uh, I'm 31 now. I was in the transition when we didn't have none of this stuff to when we got first into it, like sidekicks and Bluetooths and all right. the things started showing up in my life, right? Um, so my mom was like, I'm not able to help you write your personal statement and do everything else. And so I had to figure it out on my own. And uh, there was a program called the TRIO program that taught me how to write a personal statement that I then applied to. I got to Santa Cruz. But when I got to Santa Cruz and I got admitted, um, the regents of the University of California school system rose up tuition uh, in the four years that I was there, almost 100%. Oh I think it was like 92%. And so I, I just remember being cautious and mindful um, when I got to college that I worked really hard to get here and my parents couldn't help me. My mom was a single mother. And then I get to school and now the regents are raising our tuition. And then I was vice president of the entire university. It's a predominantly white university. There were only 2.6% uh, uh, African-Americans. And so we were a minority on a huge minority on campus. And um, I was vice president running for student body president. Our election cycle was during Black History Month. And while I am in Sacramento lobbying against the tuition increases to help every student on my campus, one of my peers hung a noose on, at school during my campaign election. So when you ask me what brings me to the work, when I tell my story, I always remind folks that sometimes we have the privilege of choosing the work because of our talents and our skill set and like our, our parents or what we read and it inspires us to be involved. And sometimes the work chooses us, right? Like the families of folks who have been murdered and killed by police, they didn't choose this. They, th this moment chose them. And so it's our obligation, I think, and, and one of my favorite quotes is, um, uh, Toni Morrison, it is, uh, activism is our rent that we spend here on the on the planet. And it's my job now to not only then, like I did, fight for improvements for Black students on campus, but um, I went I went on to do national organizing work for unions across the country and now decided to work at the NAACP because I just remember thinking two years ago that my, my talents and my gifts and my time and my energy needs to be met at the intersections of young people and Black folks. And that's what I want to focus on. Um, so, so here I am, <laughs> and uh, uh, you know, excited and honored to um, represent not only my personal experience but uplift others who have been directly impacted in this moment. Amazing! Thank you so much. And uh, and next we have Jenny, Jenny Palaguachi. Welcome, Jenny. So excited to have you a part of this uh, amazing panel with such strong, uh, intelligent women. How are you? Good, thank you. And I completely agree with you. It's honestly such an honor to be part of this panel full of powerful women that have already achieved so much. Um, so congratulations to you guys. And I can only aspire, you know, to continue to do the work that is needed in the community. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself. Uh, I, I am the healthcare advocate for the Healthcare Education Project who covers the region of Staten Island and South Brooklyn. And we at the Healthcare Education Project, we advocate for healthcare funding for all healthcare institutions, all healthcare programs, specifically our Medicaid program, which our most vulnerable population depend on. Uh, we're talking about seniors, children, our disabled community as well. We work with community members, community organizations, healthcare providers, civic and religious leaders as well to be able to advocate for this funding, to protect and to expand access to care. Um, to our communities that need it the most, um, especially now, you know, during this crisis, we have actually seen that 
or we've seen in a broader scale actually, um, that communities of color face um, a higher risk, a greater risk of health disparities and uh, a higher risk of disease and also death. And one of the reasons why it's the social determinants of health, as many of you have spoken about, right? And I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the term social determinants of health. And it's a really powerful term because it does encompass everything um, that a person it goes through that affects their ability to take care of themselves. So access to care, food insecurity, housing insecurity, right. um, and all the, these resources that are missing in our communities. So, you know, this is kind of our goal. Our goal is to support and also to empower and help lead the initiatives that look to address these issues and that look to break down these barriers to health that we have so that we can be successful, so that we can say that we have health equity and we have social justice. Um, and we work, with, like I said, we work with community partners to be able to bring these resources to the community that need it the most. And a little, I guess, uh, just to talk about myself a little bit more is um, I wasn't born here. I, um, I was born in Ecuador. I came here when I was six years old. Uh, so I've been here basically my whole life. And um, advocacy or civic engagement didn't come to me at a young age, unfortunately. Uh, I, I started working at a health center, a federally qualified health center here in Staten Island um, in 2015 or so. And so um, I started as an outreach and enrollment coordinator. So I was in a lot of communities that needed a lot of resources that didn't have, um, you know, resources or ha the hospitals were very far away from them or the population was largely immigrant. And so from there is really where I became passionate to advocate for, for them, especially for the immigrant population that was there that didn't have the resources to apply for health insurance or weren't able to see a doctor for many years until they got really, really sick because they didn't have the access to care. Or sometimes, yeah. um, you know, they would come to apply for health insurance and they would be fearful because they didn't want the government to have their information. And so I became very, very passionate to be able to speak with them um, and speak for them in that sense. And, and the healthcare education project has given me that, has been able to give me the opportunity to not just advocate in, in locally, um, but also federally, right? To try to advocate for those laws that are put into place that help our community as far as healthcare. So um, that's a little bit about me. And um, I'm definitely excited to be part of this amazing panel, as I said before. And thank you, Laura, for leading us in, in this really important discussion about the census and also about the importance of being civically engaged. No, it's so important. You know, it's crazy because I, I have been in the business of music, right? I've been in the music industry for, that's my career all my life. And, and the founder of Envision, my business partner, Sharifa Murdoch, is an incredible Black woman. Um, who has been in fashion, breaking down barriers, but we've all, you know, one of my best friends, but we've all done us in our fields. And one thing that brought us together and, and the reason why Envision was created because we, we always looked at each other and, and, and we, we gave back whenever we could in, in uh, whether we put together, you know, what Shrifa would call me, he's like, Laura, you know, I want to do some backpack giveaways, like help students say, you know, families who don't have, you know, who, who, who don't have it. And I can call some companies and we can help them and get these families some, you know, back to school clothes, some jackets, some, you know, these girls, uh, some hair care products. So, you know, it starts really small. And then one day you look in the mirror and then you see, listen, I am very privileged to be able to do what I love for a living. But what good is it if I can't give back to people who look like me? You know what I mean? Or, or, or my peers who who are, are going through it. So, you know, and and, you know, the power of music is really important, you know, it inspires us, it moves us, but our platform and our voice is even more important. And there's balance, right? Like I always tell people, it's like, yeah, you know, uh, my morning show, we play music, we interview, you know, artists and actors, but we're able to bring in community leaders, activists, people who need us to amplify their voice so they can get the tools that they need to do the work to help women like us, you know, families like us. And it's it's just really important. And, and I, I commend um, you guys because I started later on, you know what I mean? I started later on and, and young women like you are gonna make all the changes that we need. Like you guys are so inspiring in so many different ways. So just remember that, that people from all walks of life are watching you. 
are following you and are so proud of you. And to all the women that signed up for this, all men and women, by the way, who signed up uh, to watch you guys today, I, I got a lot of amazing feedback and I'm just really excited to be able to be here with you guys. All right, so let's get to it. One of the biggest things that we've been pushing on my show and I've been talking to my friends about it, and I'm going to be real honest with you, this is the first year that I've been, um, that I've been really like gung-ho about is the census, right? I, I, um, I, I, me, like many others, was kind of unsure. I kind of knew the basis of the census, but I never realized how many people were so intimidated by the census. So uh, let's kick things off uh, uh, with Nancy. Nancy, you know, there's a lot of fears. There's a lot of myths uh, doing the census, but I want you to break those down and give us some feedback and, and just really, you know, in the most simple way, let us know what exactly the census does for us and why we need to participate. Okay, so first I'm just gonna start with that the census is safe. It's safe. The, the Census Bureau cannot share your information with any other agency. They can't share it with law enforcement. They can't share it with any other government agency, nothing. It is only used for statistical purposes. That's it. Um, your information is, that, as a matter of fact, garbled up and, and shifted around. I mean, it, it doesn't even stay attached behind the scenes. It's very much protected under Title 13, which is a U.S. code, um, which even the Patriot Act cannot break. It, um, it, was, it was set that high because the census has a history that's over 236 years old, right? And so the best thing I can say, the best way to explain the census in terms of power and money, I think, is in our own history, um, which isn't pretty, but I think it explains it a little bit. So, you know, during um, slavery, um, the North at one point said to the South, uh, you can't count your slaves. Um, and the South was like, you know what do you mean? And the North said, well, you said slaves are not people. Uh, and the census only counts people. And so the North also had slaves, but not many. But the South really had a lot of slaves. And so, they had to come to a compromise. And that compromise was called the three-fifths compromise, where they said that all black, all slaves would be three-fifths of a person, would count as three-fifths of a person for the census. Now, I like to take a deep breath right there, because that's sort of traumatic sometimes to hear, but the South did not, and the North did not make that compromise um, because they wanted to somehow benefit the slaves. Those owners wanted to be benefited by the funding they receive by the count, the representation they receive by the count, right? So, and taxation you receive by the count. And so um, the, 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 the census always has been about power and money. So for example, if you have, let's say Brooklyn, I live in Fort Greene, and let's say the Fort Greene community says, we have 6,000 6, children in this community, right, in the census. Well, every school gets funded through the census dollars per child, per child. That's what a lot of people don't realize, per child. So if you say you have 6,000 people in your community, your school is getting funding for 6,000 children. Right. If you really have 12,000 children, guess what? You're getting $6,000 worth of funding. So now you can see, you can stop and you can say, oh, so is this what they mean about schools being underfunded? Um, yeah, and, and more. So we're not even taking advantage of the low hanging fruit. We're not even taking advantage of the what's due to our communities. Right, and right. so when I say it's a protest, it's a protest to roll back that history of not being counted, having hospitals. It goes the same for hospitals. It counts your community. It gives you your, a representative, which means people, your elected officials, your congressmen. It means your power. So there's two ways around politics, money and power. And if you don't have money and you got the people, you got power. So the count is necessary to exist, to be funded, 
So if you walk, you can't say, you cannot say you love children and you care about education. If you, if you didn't do the census, if you walk into school with your kid and you didn't do the census, you didn't bring funding into your, your child's school. You brought in nothing to your child's school. So it is more than just, you know, important. It's, it's been a shame and we need to have radical change in talking about the census all the time, not just when it's time to do the census. We have yeah. until October, but the numbers are low. The numbers are low. The numbers are low in every borough in New York. We're at, in Brooklyn, we're at 48% return rate. Man. They got Jenny over there. Staten Island's at 57. They're killing it in Staten Island, but they're at 57.3. Right, and we need so much more than that. And what so do you think, I, what, what do you think um, how do, what have you seen that has been working? And this is a question that eventually I'm gonna get to all of you guys, right? Um, just put it from your point of view, what is getting young people mobilized? And who do you think are the ones that are filling out? What the sense is more, what's the age bracket? You know, honestly, I, my view is a little skewed because I work with faith leaders and I'm gonna tell you something. And I tell this to them in their face. I was not happy when I got the role of being the faith manager um, with the city. I was not, I was like, what? No, I wanted this other thing. And I realized within days, weeks, that they're so fun. When you go back in history, every, every mobilization, you got youth of faith out there. They may not say it. They may not tell you they go to church, but a lot of the youth that's out there doing stuff, mobilizing, these are youth of faith. And so um, they come from a moral place, right? right? And so, and they also come from a place where there's an extra space where they're being educated, not just from school. And so I think the fact of the matter is, is that I don't know all who's filling out the census. We know that the numbers are extremely low in our communities. And that is gonna affect not only us now, what we don't we have to understand is we're gonna live with these numbers for 10 years. So the funding, so what happens is this money is our tax dollars, our money that we sent up to the federal government, to the president, to them. We gave them our money, our tax money. Every 10 years, they count everybody and, the, the, and then they decide based on that count where the money goes and then it goes to the governor and the, of the state and the state gives it to the mayor and then the mayor gives it to the city council member right so you can't go to your elected official and say oh where's my thing where's my school where's my this and you didn't do the census your elected official is not getting the funding for you and i tell this to people if your elected official is not talking about the census do not vote for them ever again because everyone should be talking about it. Tiffany knows the deal. Jenny knows the deal. Yeah. If you ain't talking about it, you're not even, you're not, these women all here are women, warriors on the ground. Jenny knows exactly the fears that people have. This, look, I tell, my family is full of conspiracy. Did I not tell you who they are? They, everyone's scared of everybody. Everything's a conspiracy. But you know what? This is what, the, you, if they want to get you, they're going to get you. That's what, I, that's at my, at, the, at my point, I'm like, it's more worth it to do it than not. It hurts us more not to do the census than the so-called risk, because there's no risk. The risk that people are talking about is that it has to go to the Supreme Court. No, your landlord is not going to know, your rent's not going to go up. Um, you're not, nobody's going to find out about your cousin not, that lives with you. If you're undocumented, nobody's gonna know, nobody's gonna come after you. Key, key. Actually, that's you'll benefit your community. Yeah. And that's hard and scary, but I'll give it to Jenny. Or, they don't even or, ask you. Jenny, they don't even ask you your key. documentation status in the census anyway. They don't even ask right. you your documentation status. I think that's important to say because that's a part of the myths also. And it's not there's a lot of conspiracy theories, but there's a lot of folks who are fearful of the census who just don't trust it. And so, you know, I, I, I tell my folks also at the NAACP, because there are black folks who are undocumented, that yes. listen, like the information that they ask you in the census does not ask you your status. So mm -hmm. I think that's important just to point out and name and emphasize. Yes. Jenny, tell us a little bit about those conversations you've had with the people that you work with. Yeah, I mean, of course. Um, I, I'm gonna specifically, specifically talk about the immigrant community because fear is, 
has been such a huge obstacle in getting them to fill out their census form. Um, first and foremost, I definitely want to reiterate what Nancy said. You know, everyone has to fill out the census. Everyone that lives here in the United States has to fill out the census, regardless of immigration status, regardless of age, regardless of race, income. They do not ask. I mean, they do ask age and, and race, but they do not care um, if you're here documented or undocumented. They do not care. And uh, unfortunately, a lot of the times, especially since last year because of the whole citizenship question um you know there was a lot more fear instilled into our community and they're still fearful uh, they're fearful to fill out any type of application and let alone the census that you know everyone is is knocking on your door for or everyone is talking about um and so one of the ways that at least that i have seen uh, when we've been out in the community communities before COVID 19 because we have started this work and i'm sure everyone has started the census work last year starting from last year right um so when we were talking to the community in regards to this specifically the immigrant community their fear um sometimes can be outweighed by other things that you that if you educate them about the census and what the census brings their fear can be outweighed by this and a lot of the times their children you know the benefits to their children uh like nancy talked about schools that has been such a huge way to to get them to understand why they need to fill out the census why um, if they don't fill out the census, it just doesn't mean that, okay, they're not filling out a, a form, they're not filling out this paper. It actually means that they're helping defund their child's school, that they're helping that school become overcrowded, that they're not giving their child the best possible education that they can get to be able to be successful. And it, it has worked in many different types of environments. Um, even with uh, applying for health insurance, you know, this has worked that the benefit to the child, it outweighs the fear that they have uh, from the federal government, right? And so that that's really my big message uh, most of the time to, to families, fill it out. Don't do it for you because, okay, fine, you don't want to do it for you. You don't think it's going to benefit you. Um, this is, we're talking about 10 years of funding. And if you think it's not going to benefit you, then okay, that's okay. But don't mess with their children. And um, right. immigrants are very... Uh, powerful, they're fighters, you know, a lot of them came to this country looking for a better life for their families, for their kids to provide for them. And when you touch that topic, they become very engaged, they engage with you and they understand, um, you know, why even if they don't understand everything that the census encompasses everything that the census is providing for, they understand that the census provides for their child for them to have a better life for them to have food at school so that they don't have to buy it or they don't have to send them school lunch that you know um that they can have a wick or child care if they need it they understand these things so um getting that message out and just letting them know i have seen that it has helped having that conversation with uh with with the immigrant population is talking to them about their kids and their family um, and talking to them that, and explaining to them that, you know, under, you're not just not filling out the form, you're underfunding uh, the schools and you're underfunding um, a lot of healthcare specifically every single year. Uh, like I mentioned, we advocate for healthcare funding for our Medicaid program every single year. We, uh, when budget season comes around, we're always in, in, um, in Albany advocating making sure that okay uh, there's going to be cuts to health care there's going to be cuts to medicare to medicaid and we're always there fighting that hey no listen this many people depend on medicaid this many people like 2.5 million children depend on medicaid how can you take that from them how can you take it away from 630,000 seniors how can you take it away from 6.5 million new yorkers that depend on medicaid and a lot of it is because there wasn't enough funding or not enough people were counted uh, in 2010. You know, there, there was, a, I'm sure Nancy can mention, there was 5 million children not counted. Am I correct, Nancy? Yes. Six, almost 6.5 six, six, six almost. Five million children. Right. And so now, you know, 10 years later, we're seeing why schools cut uh, after school programs why the Medicaid system has uh, made budget cuts, why we're always fighting for those, um, for the Medicaid system not to be cut. And this is the reason why, because those people were not counted. 
And if we do this, if we make the same mistake again within the next 10 years, and especially because of the pandemic, you know, the pandemic has affected a lot of our small businesses, a lot of our hospitals, a lot of everything, honestly, everything here in New York State. And if we're not counted, we're making it worse for ourselves for the next 10 years. We're going to see a lot more cuts in healthcare, in education, in safety, and after school programs and youth programs, we're going to see cuts across the board. Oh, absolutely. And, absolutely. you know, that that's something that we need everyone to understand. Fill out the census form because it doesn't mean that you're not just not filling it out. You're actually defunding and hurting not just yourself, your family, but everyone, everyone here in New York. And then people complain, you know, why we don't have resources here. And that's the reason why. And that's a small form can help make such a big change within the next 10 years um, that it, it doesn't even take, I think, 10 minutes. 10 well, minutes? Okay. I, 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 it took me five yeah, it's, it's, minutes. It's 10, it's 10 minutes, I was 10 like, questions, <laughs> Yeah. 10 years. You say three minutes? It took me well, like, yeah, two, three minutes. I did yeah. it quickly. I was well, what we, 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 I, I timed we, it. It's on my Instagram. I timed the whole thing. It was three minutes. Yeah, yeah. Ten, well, we, we try to try, we say, look, it's 10 minutes, 10 questions, 10 years. Say you're not really computer savvy. You know, it's 10 minutes, 10 questions, 10 years. I want to thank you, Jenny. You said that eloquently, really, really eloquently. It really, the, you cannot ask to defund anything if you don't understand where the funding comes from. Right. And I think so if you're going to protest, know, the, know your enemy. Yeah. Understand how the system works. You have to get counted to get the power to make the changes that we want to make. So we need to be out on the streets. See, everybody's like, don't do this for this. This is such a big, if we want to make change, we need to stop saying, hey, you need to do what I'm doing. We all need to take a bite out of this animal. We well, everything all is connected, need to, right, Nancy? We, everything is connected because I, you know, I all of it. Cleaning, I'm like, oh my God, they're cutting after school programs. I was like, well, when they cut after school programs, that means our kids, especially the inner city youth, have nowhere to go. It means they're going to be hanging out on the corner on the streets outside their buildings because they have nowhere to go, right? They're stuck in their apartments. People don't have AC. It's hot as hell. Where are they going to be chilling outside? Their kids doing kid things. Next thing you know, we have neighborhoods that are over policed. What's going to happen? Our kids get locked up. If they can't afford bail, next thing you know, they're doing two, three, four, five years in jail. And it, it's a exactly. six. Exactly. But you, it, it's just a piece of the system. It's understand. The more we understand, and, I, and that's why I talk about not just in talking about the census and, and, and what Tiffany's doing and what Jenny's doing is that we have to translate, you know, what a lot of government is doing to the community and we shouldn't have to do that there should be radical change in communication because we people are not getting it are not and they're not even trying to get people to get it right so we need to be real about that nancy i want to hop in and talk a little bit about that communication piece too i think as someone who works at the intersection of like social justice and social media um, as a content creator, as a strategist, understanding the ways that we, as people with platforms, all of us have platforms, right? Whether it's a thousand followers or a hundred thousand followers, we have people who are subscribing to the things that we're saying every day. Um, and I think social media is this really powerful tool to bring people information like this, meet them where they're at, right? As organizers, that's what we do. We meet people where they're at. Um, and so social media is a really great tool to do that, especially in light of COVID when we can't be out there door knocking, right? We can't be tabling at events, but we can be showing up in their feed. We can be showing up on their For You page. I actually just made a TikTok about the census that did really well. That was like in the format of like, that's not your man, that's the blank. Like he shows up at your house. He wants to know more about you. That's not your man, that's the census. And it did really well, right? All these young people are getting more information and I'm like, it's due this day, like go check it out. Um, and the ways that we could be more creative in, in how we communicate and translate this information to meet people where they're at and bring it to them in a way that they understand. Um, and I think, you know, social media is just one way to do that. TikTok, Instagram, Twitter, can whatever. I, can um, I just jump in and just say, I loved what you said. And, you know, I just want to say that I do come from, 
I'm next to you, young, young ladies, and I am a little older and there needs to be more of that. There does. There needs to be, because I, you know, I was, I was watching Sister Soldier, right? I was there when Rodney King, I was there with, I was young with Eleanor Bumpers, but it's not any time, and I give this advice to young ladies and young men all over. As you go through your life, always have people older and younger, people you mentor and people you look up to. Don't just stay in your peer group. There's a lot for us to learn from each other. Our, my generation, the 80s generation, listen, I have a son that's 23, and I'm gonna tell you something. My goal was to keep him safe. Anybody who came out of the 80s, we barely made it out of there. We, we barely made it out with our lives. It was so violent if you lived in New York at the time that I lived. And we just wanted to keep the millennials now that are talking safe. And people try to trash them all the time. You're the best writers. You're, you're, so, you're so on point. Social media has taught you to go right to the point. That's why this is it's gonna stop with this generation. That's why, because they're not, they want, to, they want clarity. They don't want you to just tell them some whatever, whatever. They want clarity. And I'm, tell, I'm telling you as somebody a little bit outside of that is do that, do that guys. Keep it, keep it up and talk to each other so that we don't repeat things. Like we can, do, we can move a little faster. We already did this. We can move a little bit faster. If nobody knows about Eleanor Bumpers, she was 72 and shot with a shotgun in New York City because she had a, something, a, a spoon in her hand. So we, we've been, look, there, it's not about putting each other down, it's about bringing each other up and learning from each other. I'm learning about social media. I suck at social media. They're helping me get it, but because people feel I have a message and together we could rule the world. You know, right. we're on your side. So I, I'm letting you know right now, I'm on the millennial side and the Z generation side, they're getting it done. And we need to make sure we share our knowledge and our experience so you could use it to strategize. No, and that's the whole point of this today because it's really important. Look, we have women from all walks of life, all, all, all age groups, you know what I mean? All um, ethnicities. But Deja, tell us a little bit about how you keep your your um, your age group, your peers mobilized? How do you keep them engaged and how do you inspire um, other students to, to join the fight and be as active as you are? Yeah, so I mean, I started in this work when I was 15, when I first became homeless and I saw the ways that my school district sex education, which had last been updated in the 80s, which didn't even mention consent, which was medically inaccurate, was disproportionately affecting students like me who didn't have parents at home to supplement this information, right? And so I started showing up at school board meetings and telling my story. And then I started bringing friends along and they started bringing their friends along. And I think that it's this idea of relational organizing, of bringing in the people who have personal relationships with you to care about the issues you care about. And I think that we see that, we talk about relational organizing all the time on the ground, right? About bringing your friends to a school board meeting. But I also wanna expand that conversation as we think about how we do that in the digital age, right? How are we bringing in people who have stake in us, digital stake? How are we mobilizing the relationships we've created, cultivated, built um, online? Uh, and especially as a generation like mine, where we've been born and raised, um, we were born and raised with our, our phones. We've never lost contact with anyone, right? I had Facebook at the first time when I was 11. Um, so it's been going like nine years strong. Um, and so how do we mobilize these relationships? How do we utilize these platforms um, to really bring each other into the work that we're doing? Um, and I think that social media is an incredible tool to do that, whether it's like using the swipe up feature, right? The sense is you can fill it out online, swipe up. Like there's no reason we can't be doing that. There's no reason we can't be checking in with our friends, right? Shooting them a DM, um, letting them know. Uh, there's like all kinds of ways um, that I think we as a generation and um, as young people are kind of leading the way in figuring out how, how we use social media to create change um, beyond just like, here's raising awareness, but how do we move people from awareness and consciousness raising moments to action? Um, but yeah, I would say 
it's really about mobilizing those relationships and people that have stake in you in the same way that I was bringing people to school board meetings, bringing people in who follow you, who message you, who swipe up on your stories. Tiffany, tell us a little bit about, I mean, I know you touched on it already, but let's get a little deeper on the work that you do at, in universities and how you, um, you're such a force. How do you mobilize these students? How do you mobilize the people who follow you? How do, how do you, yeah, how do you make that connection and let it stick? And, and I just want to know how you get your youth involved. So uh, that's a great question, but I'm going to start by saying it's not easy, right? Because the question is how, like, I, I just know that um, a lot of us might think that the work that we do comes because we get paid and it's like a ABC formula that we have to use, but because I do national work, what I might do for Tallahassee, Florida is very different from what happens in San Francisco, California, and how I engage with my folks in Houston, Texas is very different from how I engage with my folks in Hartford, Connecticut. So okay. what I'm about to offer is just like along the spectrum of things. And the first is what I think folks have already touched on, but I want to break it down is this education piece, right? Um, folks, I had a, we had a class, um, NAACP is doing this thing called Black Civic Summer. Um, and we're having five courses where we're talking about civic engagement and educating folks. And we had 700 people on our first class that just happened this last Tuesday. And I brought Grecia Martinez, who is one of the deputy directors from United We Dream onto the call to talk about the intersections of what's happening with um, the campaign to abolish ICE and the campaign to abolish the police. People were in the chat saying, I don't even know what ICE is, right? And folks were talking like, oh, you don't know what ICE is. You're not woke. Why don't you know what ICE is? And I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Out of shaming. Oh, yeah. You don't know what you don't know. And they do not, t I did never, I never heard of the ICE agency. I never heard of the census when I was in school. Not high school, not college, not nothing. And so we all come into this work as organizers and to um, Deja, I think is your name, right, Deja? To Deja's point that she said earlier, to meeting people where they're at and bringing people along who, have, who are uh, folks that we have influence with um, not over, but with, is our responsibility to in expose them to those new things. And so the first is education. The second is we have to have this conversation in schools, right? Like it's not just up to us to post it and have it on a panel with Envision on in the middle of COVID-19, like to expect people to learn about it here. We have to be able to also have this conversation with teachers, with the teachers. How do you union. do that, Tiffany, though? What, if it's not, if it's something that your school is not offering, how do you push to get those conversations to happen? That's a fantastic question. You could do it two ways that I'm working with my students on. One is we have student organizations that exist, middle school, high school, and college, whether that's a black student union, a student government, whether it's a women's center, whether it's a healthcare center, whether it's a Greek organization, whether it's the list, the NAACP chapter, the list, the queer student union, the list can go on. And we are working by providing them the materials and the information to let them know that this is the timeline and the duration of the census. You yeah. have the obligation in your own student body meetings to educate your peers about this one. And two, it's also our responsibility because students pay tuition, because students pay for school to talk and to communicate with their teachers and educators to say, listen, we've been going two years and we haven't heard anything about the census. Let's put this in our homework. Let's put this in our activities, Let's put this in our education system to have that conversation. But it's a two way street. I know I didn't learn who John Lewis was until I got to Washington, DC. I didn't learn about who John Lewis was in college, but that's not fair. So now I'm a keynote speaker for the black graduation at UC Santa Cruz. I'm going back and, and like the Sankofa proverb says, I'm giving back to where I came from by educating them and talking about all these issues and, and these, um, uh, these lessons that I wish I would have learned. The yeah. second thing is we really have to have these conversations about the census, not just from the conversation of let's make sure we do it, but connecting it to people's daily lived experience, right? The census is not just a tool, it's also the tactic that we need to use to move our agenda. Voting, I always say this, voting is necessary, but it's not sufficient. Voting is the tool. The census is necessary, but it's not gonna fix all the world's problems, it's not sufficient. So we need to fill out the census and we need to vote. And those things are simple, we've already covered and I'm glad we did, and Jenny talked about this, uh, working with the immigration community, but I also wanna uplift our folks who are incarcerated, right? Like folks hey. who are incarcerated, they're also counted by the census. And when we talk about gerrymandering and we talk about where precincts are and people's rights and where people get funding, um, especially watching the COVID-19 pandemic happen, there have been hundreds of articles that have come out about personal stories of people who are incarcerated, who have been killed because of COVID and not receiving proper health care. When we talk about the services that go to those prisons, that is also used by the, that is also counted by the census. When we saw 60 million people file for unemployment, my mother was one of them. The money that Congress just voted to pass to give to the unemployment programs across the country don't just go because we have 
X amount of people who are unemployed in your state or in your city, but it goes by the census. How many people live in that city in that community anyway? And we're going to send the unemployment money from the national office to those people. So, so whether we're in a crisis or whether we're not in a crisis, my students and my young folks across the country are connecting the census directly to issues that matter every single day to these to, to my people, right? People who are mass incarcerated, people who are incarcerated or have gone through the incarceration system, people who black people who are experiencing health disparities right now when it comes to COVID-19 and who are dying at alarming rates because they because first of all, doctors don't believe black women, but second of all, because we don't have the resources that we need to take care of our bodies and ourselves anyway. Um, and then lastly, it's what Deja said earlier, and I need to emphasize this because this is the, the foundation of what I do, the relational organizing, right? So it's not just the influence on social media, but it's also if I filled out my census. And my uncle John in Los Angeles and Inglewood hasn't filled out the census. I need to call to make sure he fills it out. And if he needs to help, I need to help him, right? Because he's 70 years old. I got to make sure he has what he needs and can answer the questions. Last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop. Um, the One of the uh, other confusing parts about the census is because everybody has had relocated, right? My students have relocated off of campus because of COVID-19. We do not know when they're going back. Folks think that they have to wait to get the census package in the mail to get their code, and that's not true. You can go right now to 2020census.gov, type in your address, and it'll automatically generate your code for you and give it to you. You do not have to wait to get anything in the mail. That is Both key, Tiffany. That is key. Yeah, I know. <laughs> that's why I said it. And get in the mail. No, that's why I said it, because it is key. You don't have to wait for your golden ticket to come. It might not ever get to you, but that doesn't mean that you can't get counted, right? And so our opportunity is to make sure that we... Um, uh, go on 2020census.gov, type in your address. It'll automatically generate your code for you. You ain't even got to wait in the mail no more, and then you can fill it out. And unfortunately, we have a huge homeless population here in Washington, D.C. Those folks do not get counted by the census because the census is counted by if you have a home and where you are in your in your residential. Nancy? No, 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 no. That's not how it goes. So the, 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 home, the, homeless, the homeless population is counted by by a different part of the census. It's not, it's not, it's not counted like the general population. So they are, they are not left there to self-respond. So in New York City, um, if you're in a shelter, you are counted. If you are a shelter resident, you are going to be counted in the census. If you are street homeless, there's a team that goes out um, and is and has been counting. And they count the street homeless in a in a particular way to collect that those statistics. And that's I think that's on a national level. Um, so uh, it's just a separate way in which they're counting them. It's not. It's it's. That's good to know. That is, that's good. Yeah. It's, it's they, okay. the homeless absolutely are being counted. And I thank you for that, Tiffany. Absolutely, people think they have sure. to pay. People are confused. I'm so thank you for saying that. And you know what? There's also you can also text. Census 2020 to 877-877, and the phone number will pop up because you can also do the census on the phone, meaning you could call. So if there's a senior, your grandma, somebody else who has difficulty doing it on their phone, or on the computer, they can also call the number, all right? Um, Good to know. I need to find out who that street team is in DC because I volunteer for a homeless shelter down the street. And the website also, the national website says- It's gonna, when we get off, I'm gonna, uh, I will connect you. When, yeah. I, when we get off, I will connect you with yeah, the yeah. census Street that, yeah. yeah. I want to make a comment about, sorry, I want to make a comment as well about, um, you know, we're talking about street homelessness, shelter homelessness. I'm someone who experienced hidden homelessness, which is bouncing around between homes, which is really common for young people, like I said, one in 30 between 13 and 17 in the U.S. And so something that's important for young people, period, but young people particularly who might live in untraditional situations um, is making a plan around the census, right? So making sure that you're communicating with either the family you live with or other family members, whoever, that someone is counting you or that you are being counted in some way. Whether that's because you're bouncing around because of school or generally your situation, having that open communication with the people in your community, in your life, uh, whether they be family chosen or otherwise, um, that you are being counted and advocating on behalf of yourself um, to make sure that you're showing up on someone's census. So we're having some questions come in, guys, and um, just raise your hand or speak up if you want to take it. Um, and if someone answers, I call on someone to answer it and somebody wants to add on, we can do that, okay? But um, here is a question. Um, policies can be really difficult to read and understand. What are some sites that we can go to to educate ourselves on some of these laws? Anybody want to take this one? 
Okay, go for it. Wait, I can't hear you. So this is this is this is this is it. This is the issue, right? Um, it the policies are difficult, but it's not just the policies. The instructions of where the meeting is 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 confusing. If you ever even get to find out where they're having a community meeting, if you're not in the know, that is the problem. I would say with with the census. I, I, I mean, I'm I can't speak for just the census, but I will say I can give you if it's about. And I, I, I'm not the voter professional, but I came across an amazing organization called Voter Riders. Um, and um, I just had a friend who is in New York, but she's originally from Wisconsin. And since she thinks it's a swing state, she's trying to influence through social media um, in Wisconsin. Wisconsin also has very stringent laws on uh, you have to have a photo ID, practically have to get your birth certificate. Um, you know, well, let's put it this way, 50% you need your driver's license to do this, to do to vote in Wisconsin, and 50% of Black people in Wisconsin, in Wisconsin don't have photo ID. So um, this organization, vote, Voter Riders, you call them up, you tell them what state you're in, they will talk to you about the laws in your state in terms of how you can register, what you need. And they will help give you a stipend if you have to pay for a birth certificate. They will pay to help you get your ID and they will help you get transportation. So oh, wow. I called them myself to see what the deal was. And they called me, they called me back within 10 minutes. Um, and they were extremely knowledgeable and we were texting. So that's a way to also protest and help and support your community is to try to stop some of these states that are literally literally trying to stop people from um, from voting. So I, I, they're called voter voterwriters.org. Amazing. Do any of you guys want to share any organizations or any any websites um, that are super helpful for people to get information, just basic information on voting and on the census? Yeah. Jenny, you're gonna, are you going to go ahead, Jenny? No, I was going to say, I was just going to say as far as like policy, um, just kind of a summary and, you know, kind of just to understand what's happening. As far as healthcare, our organization, the Healthcare Education Project, um, on our website, we do have a lot of resources and, you know, terms of how to understand healthcare and um, in regards to the ACA and the different uh, bills that came up during the pandemic. Um, and it just, it just helps you understand. So as far as policy, that is a resource that you guys can go to. It's the Healthcare Education um, Project.org. And you can, you know, check out different resources that are there. We do also have a resource in regards to the census. So very basic, what is the census? What does the census do? Who is affected by the census? Um, you know, it, it touches upon the whole immigration question, oh, I'm, I'm sorry, the citizen question that they were trying to put into the census. So that that is a resource for you guys to check out. And I mean, I think uh, it, to follow up after this, um, it would be a great thing to kind of put together a list of all these different websites that you know, offer this, that it, and yeah. it's true. Sometimes even for us, something comes up, a different policy comes up, or there's a, a bill or, or something like that. We have to go online and Google, okay, what does this mean? And that's for us that, you know, we're in this line of work. So I can only imagine for people that are in, the, in this type of work, but um, want to know more, it's difficult. It's difficult to understand the, the language that's used in those bills. So I definitely encourage you guys to check that website out and also um, we will follow and I'll make sure that in, in our website we post something um, in regards to all these other resources that we can go to that you can check out for more information. Thank Hi. you. Can I add one more? Can I, I my office is going to kill me if I don't put the census out there. Absolutely. Uh, if you go to nyc.gov, um, I, I figure you guys are going to put this out there so because I sent some of the info and you do census calls you can you can contact us as a group register and we will if you have a phone and a computer you can um, call your community and talk up and ask them to do the census so that's a way you can volunteer with us and once you go there there's many many ways to volunteer we also have content social media content, we have information. So if you go to New NYC Census 2020, you will find a, a, a plethora of information, a, 
an abundance of information about the census um, that you could even use and you could pull in different languages also, in Arabic and Spanish and um, in 13 different languages, um, we have it on our site. So we have ads um, and, and some of the voting stuff. We also, you, which you can forward to the community so that they can post as well. No, 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 Lord, it's very important in their language. So we're gonna get some final words, guys, and just, I'm gonna go to each and every one of you for final words, just last things that you wanna say, and I wanna make sure that you plug in your websites and your social media so everybody who's locked in can follow you guys. And I'm sure you guys get a thousand emails and DMs, but um, that's why that's why we're here, right? So Tiffany, I'll let you go first. Thanks, uh, so really quickly, I don't have much to say except for thank you so much for having me. Um, this is a really important discussion to have at this moment. And uh, I want folks to uh, visit vote.org, super simple, vote.org. The NAACP has a national partnership with them and you can do everything on the site, including register to vote, check your absentee stat, check your status, uh, request your absentee ballot and request your mail-in ballot. You can do all the things from one site. It allows you to fill out your forms and send it, and it can send you text message reminders of where your precincts are. The second website is the last thing I'll say, um, vote.org and rockthevote.org, because rockthevote.org during this time right now, uh, with COVID, all the laws keep changing and the rules keep changing and the dates and the deadlines keep changing because of COVID-19. So we yeah. saw 13 states move their primaries because of the situation and some precincts have been canceled. I'll give you a quick example. I had to vote on June 2nd here in DC and I didn't know that because my last name is Lofton, that there's a certain window that they want people to come if your last name's over the certain, certain letter, A through M and then M through Z to get people to do, to do social distancing. And so you have to actually check and look this stuff up read your voter guide, visit vote.org, and then go to vote, uh, vote.org and rockthevote.com, excuse me, rockthevote.com to check out the latest details. Okay, Jenny, any final words? Yes, definitely. So the only thing I wanna say is um, the census is power, like Nancy mentioned. So I wanna make sure that everyone turns their fear into power by filling out their census form because it is power that comes into, into our communities um, and also to make sure that you guys vote on the, the New York primaries, June 23rd, please make sure you guys go out to vote. It, it is a primary. Um, a lot of people feel that it's not important, but it is really, really important. Delegates are chosen during the primary. They help shape the, the, um, the platform that, you know, the, the candidate will take. So I definitely encourage you guys to please make sure you guys are registered register to vote and go out to vote in the primaries June 23rd. You can do it many different ways. You can request an absentee ballot, ballot before June 16th. You can uh, do early voting here in New York State. You can also go to the polls on June, on June 23rd and make sure that you exercise your right to vote. Um, and also make sure you fill out your census, extremely important. Remember, if you're not filling that out, it means that you're helping defund all these federal programs and all these programs that are needed to address the social determinants of health and also the health disparities that our communities are facing in so many neighborhoods. So thank you for having me. Thank you for the uh, for the Envision team for having us. Uh, you ladies were amazing. And thank you everyone that joined us. Uh, you know, I hope that you learned something that you were inspired to go out and help someone or inspire someone to fill out their census and to go out and vote. So thank Jenny, you. What's the, what, what's the official um, social media handles for the HEP organization? So it is, <laughs> we each region, yeah, it, it's on the website. Each region has their own HEP, um, their own Twitter page. I mean, the main one is HEP New York. Um, okay. and that's the main Twitter, the Facebook page, but each region does have their own uh, Twitter and Facebook page so that you can see what's happening, you know, upstate in Buffalo and what are they doing in Staten Island and what is happening in, in Brooklyn and so on. So I definitely encourage you guys to check out the website, follow us on um, HEP, HEP New York, and um, then you can follow our other, our other advocates throughout the New York State to see what we're each up to. Amazing. Deja, hit us with some final words. Thank you so much for everything. Yeah, I'm happy to be on. Uh, thank you all so much for showing up, listening and sticking around. Uh, you can join me on my personal page at Deja Fox, D-E-J-A-F-O-X-X, -X, um, or my organization at Gen Z Girl Gang. Uh, there's links in our bio to get involved in all kinds of things. We post opportunities every day, um, whether it's internships or volunteering or phone banking. Um, so many different community sourced opportunities to just 
get involved, take that step, go from zero to one. Um, and we also do a political roundup every week that translates things that are happening in our world, big news stories into things that are easily shareable on social media and that are written for and by young women. Um, so go check us out at Gen Z Girl Gang. Um, and again, thank you so much for having me on. I think my call to action to everyone on here would be to post something about the census today, uh, whether it's a swipe up link if you have that feature or, you know, maybe if you're not big into social, just shooting something in your group messages, your family mm -hmm. group chat, something like this. And Nancy, before we get out of here, please hit us with the official websites where we need to go to get involved. So definitely NYC Census 2020. Um, definitely, uh, you, listen, just go to NYC Census 2020. Everything is there for you. Um, we will send you out the Hester Street map where you can also follow along. If you, some people really are techie and like to do that and you guys should post it because you can actually put in your zip code and find out exactly your neighborhood, what, what your um, response rate is. So that's Hester Street map, but just go to any, anytime you Google census 2020, it's there, it's there. And we are looking for volunteers. Um, and I just want to thank all these ladies here that were such a uh, inspiration and so awesome and things that I didn't remember someone else got it. And I'm so excited um, for what people are going to do out there. Um, I have an Instagram called short and sweet with just short little clips of sort of information uh, about how things kind of work. Um, so you can feel Feel free to do that. Um, but also, once again, please fill out your your census. Um, and I want to thank you, Laura, uh, as, as for being such a great host and opening up your platform for this. Um, I, I just really appreciate it. And this is the first time, honestly, and this is the last thing I'm going to say, that I was on a Zoom call with people talking about the census that were talking to the people and not speaking in this really high place instead of in a place where you could tell the people on this call work with the people. Um, and so I really appreciate being in, in, in those surroundings. Uh, um, I guess being around a lot of politics all day long, I love to be with the people. So thank you for bringing me here. Thank you for listening. And thank you for letting me be here. I, I'm so humbled to be here with you. Do well, the census. You. It's been a pleasure. Please fill out your census. And I encourage everyone to follow us at Envision Fest, E N V S N F E S T. Um, this year, we're we'll going to focus on a lot of uh, digital conferences like this. But don't worry, next year, we'll have our festival on and popping. Hopefully, we'll get to see you ladies there. But just understand that conversations like this, this is just one of many that we're planning to have, okay? Uh, we'll, we'll, you know, we cover a little bit of everything on our platform, but um, we need to do this for us, by us, because it's our communities depend on it. So thank you once again for all your incredible hard work and dedication. Okay, guys, one more time. Uh, just I'm just gonna clap for you guys. Thank you, thank you. Bye, everybody.